When last we spoke with Judy Joseph McSween, we were discussing the recent spate of racist posts on social media platforms, and this was as part of a panel for HERMAT, the Human Resource Management Association of Trinidad and Tobago. Now, speaking specifically with the young lady now, she's an accomplished organization development facilitator and entrepreneur. She's also the developer of the Time Out suite of corporate and personal interventions. So we say good evening, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining us. Good evening, DK. Good to be here. No, we didn't delve into it the last time around, but when we say time out and those kind of interventions, what do we mean? So it's the recognition that we live in a world now driven by technology that requires us to be very busy, to respond very quickly to things. And because of that busyness, we lose a lot of the wisdom that ought to naturally emerge from within us. So in my capacity as a timeout specialist, I encourage, encourage individuals and groups to pause. And in that pause, be able to reflect on patterns in their behaviors, their, their thinking patterns that are either serving them or impeding them in being their best selves. It's also watching how that pause allows us to reflect on our relationships and come to the root cause of the conflicts that are there, either intra or interpersonal. But look at the fact that so much is happening, as you said, and so many things call our attention to them. We need to deal with this, we need to deal with that. What are some of the ways that we can actually kind of be fully present in these individual tasks that we're trying to multitask and address? So one of the easiest ways to bring ourselves to the present moment is to become conscious of our breathing. So you find that a lot of organizations locally and internationally have been engaging conversations around mindfulness. And mindfulness is really about bringing yourself to that present moment. Usually I would tell my clients the easiest way is to pause and become conscious of your breathing and then take some deep breaths. And then try to still your thoughts. And, and usually we still the thoughts by reciting a mantra. Um, that mantra varies depending on the type of organization that you're working for or the individual that, are, that you're working for. One of the things I must say deeply about this timeout is recognizing that right now we are operating in a world that's highly volatile highly uncertain, highly complex, highly ambiguous. And within an environment like that, you really need to have clarity and focus in your thinking. So if you're distracted, you're not being your best self at a time when you really need to be your best self. No, you, you speak of the volatility and all the things that we're facing with, but at the same time, when you say time out, and I shared this with you before. Sometimes we can look at time out as something that has, is very full of negative connotations. So you get put in time out. You get sent to time out. You're caucused. You are given a probation. What, how do we kind of reframe that thinking about the, the term, the phrase, the action? What, where, where, what was the jump off or the focal point to do that? So I want to cover that from a couple of perspectives because one of the things is that if a friend asks you what you did this weekend and you said, oh, all I did was sleep, they figure if you're lazy, they figure that you've wasted your time. If you said, well, I, I had to work from nine to five and then I had to go to the gym and then get to the spot, all of a sudden you sound very productive. So one of the things is shifting from the ego self that wants to conform to that sort of mindset to the higher self that acknowledges the importance of a pause. The other thing is, when we, although we say that we were put in punishment uh, and, and given a timeout, when you think of it, say perhaps in the context of sports, a basketball timeout, a, a hockey half time, a football half time, that is a pause for you to reflect on how the game was going, what was working, what was not working and how we can improve for ourselves in the next quarter or in the next half. Your teachers actually did you a favor when they said to you, take a time out, 
because you had the opportunity then to reflect on the action that caused you to be where you are and determine whether it's something you're going to repeat or it's something you're better off not doing. So there is a lot to be gained from a timeout and especially at a time like this. But what if you don't take that time? So you have the time, you are afforded the time to do that reflection, but you don't take it. So I'm only here because Miss sent me, not that I am presented with an opportunity to reflect and be a better self. What, what are some of the ways that we can actually look at turning that conversation a little bit so we see positive connotations versus negative? Right. Well, in the first place, it has to be the awareness that when we speak, we have a way of impacting how the other receives our information. In conversational intelligence, what you become aware of is the fact that depending on how we frame things, it can trigger the cortisol. So I think it's, a, it's punishment. I want to defend myself. I become aggressive. I withdraw. Or we can reframe it in words where it triggers the oxytocin in the other person, where the other person sees that maybe as a collaboration for me to become my better self. I can see that there is a positive in this rather than focusing on the, the negative dimension on it. In organizations, a lot of times we tend to focus on the penal dimension of, of, of something that somebody has done rather than seeing it as an opportunity to coach the person. And let me ask the question, jumping back a little bit, how did you get into this in the first place? Because now we're seeing uh, a heavy emphasis being placed on soft skills being able to work with individuals. And uh, we're grateful for the work that you've already put in, in terms of being able to deal with conversations, emotion, and these types of intelligences. But what made you say, okay, well, this is something that I want to pursue in this type of manner? So I actually came out of the technical field. I'm an industrial chemist. And I used to consult around manufacturing operations. And, and what I found is that people You'd go in, they'd make recommendations, they, you implement them. And some years later, well, a year later, or few months later, you come back and they've reverted to their, their old behavior. And I asked myself, what would make me transform, meaning, meaning change my mindset completely and stick with what I, I know is best? So I myself did some introspective work. I was also introduced to meditation. And one of the things that I found with meditation is that it facilitated the presence and the self-awareness that leads to transformation. I didn't go into it expecting that, but that is what I saw happening to myself. I started to listen better. I was more conscious of my impact on others. And so I delved into that a lot more deeply. And once I recognize that, you know, that there's the scientific, the scientific data that supports it, I began introducing it to others. The other thing that I got involved in was organization development work, where I was always told that for, to be an effective organizational development person, you have to be aware of yourself as you interact with the client. In other words, how what you are doing as an individual is impacting your client. So there was also that heightened self-awareness emanating from that. And then later on, I, I did something called the Frameworks Coaching Process, which was something that heightened or brought to the forefront the fact that, yes, we talk about the five senses, but there is that sixth sense that we all have, which tends to be underdeveloped. And what I realized is that between the meditation and the frameworks coaching process, that my ability to hear my inner voice was heightening. And then that pathway took me into emotional intelligence, by extension, conversational intelligence, and then being certified as a spiritual intelligence coach, because they all linked together. But for us to be able to take our intelligences to the next level, we first of all have to be aware and fully present. And then once we are aware, we're able to manage selves better. We are able to link to others better and manage our relationships better. 
One of the things we need to do is manage our time. So we take a short break. When we return, we continue speaking with Ms. Judy Joseph McSween. Stay with us. Welcome back. We're speaking with Judy Joseph McSween. And I find it very interesting that she says that she has a technical background in chemistry, but now we're dealing with a sort of uh, emotional alchemy. But in terms of reaching out to people or contacting people, how do people contact you? Where do you get your clients from? How do people find you? A lot of my clients come from referrals. So somebody would have had the experience of the time out and they recommend it to, to someone else. And I, I work with individuals, I work with groups. I'm also very much on social media. I'm on LinkedIn, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Instagram. It's easy to locate me. Um, on those platforms, I share some of the work that I do and some of my thinking around being a fully intelligent leader. Um, and you can call me 684-9827. I'm on WhatsApp. Very easy, very readily accessible. And all, my, all the work that I do is available online. All the retreats, all the individual coaching, the group coaching um, is available online. And that raises the question, how has your work, your practice changed with the need to be a lot more online as opposed to being face to face? Because I can imagine there'll be some drop off in some, in some instances where you'd be in a space, you get the energy of a person, you're able to see subtle nonverbal cues how has that changed for you? So, you know, one of the things that I talk about in my practice is that ability to reflect, learn from the past, and bring it into the present. So even before COVID, there was the odd client that I would do online, and there was never an issue around doing that. Um, last year, I remember at some point in time, praying for an online-based business. And then COVID came. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know, God, is a, God has a sense of humor because it never dawned on me that all that I was doing was, it was possible to do it online. And it really was an easy migration, easy migration in terms of the fact that I don't think I've lost from the feedback I've gotten. The quality of the introspective work remains um, as it was before. But there is a lot more work entailed in designing the process. Um, but I'm glad to say that I haven't lost that human touch, that ability to, as you say, read the signs of people because I am a virtual. I think if anything, it might be even more intense because my clients now are much more fully present when they, they sit in front of the screen versus where you know, they might have been in the office and be distracted by the phone, et cetera, people coming into the meeting room. Now, when they sit down to have a session with me, it's because they, they want to, they want to have this session and they are 100% present. So I've, I've really enjoyed working online with clients. But do you, find, do you find requests changing or people asking you to design things a little differently uh, during the pandemic? And I'm thinking people more like organizations or groups. So the nature of the, the work um, is basically the same. However, what I'm seeing now is an increased awareness in leadership and executive of the need for not what I call the soft skills, but what I call the power tools. The, there is a heightened awareness as to why the emotional intelligence the conversational intelligence is critical for performance management of their organization. So the conversations um, and the desire to have this as an integral as they move through COVID and into the future have become more intense. And one of the reasons I ask is because people, there's been, there have been conversations of what hours look like because the fact that I can reach you easily, even though you are remotely located, does that mean I'm still looking for you to function eight to four? Do I think that I am enabled enough to call you at 10 o'clock in the night when you're possibly doing something else and you don't have workload on your mind? And this is an, as an executive or as uh, an assigned superior. And have you been having conversations like that? 
So one of the things we have to be aware of is boundaries, personal and professional boundaries, and recognize that they're there for a purpose. And although technology allows you to contact people 24 seven, it is not necessary for them to respond to you 24 um, seven. I know that sometimes I wake up maybe at midnight and I have an idea in my head and I, I may dash off an email, but it's not with the intent of a response from the person. The person aggravates it when they respond because when I see the response, I might think, ah, oh, Maybe I should continue the conversation. So it's very important that we, you know, this is the emotional intelligence again, that we manage cells, manage our expectations and manage the expectations of others. And no, it's not good to expect me to function 24 seven because I need the time out to balance and be able to manage and to be able to operate, to function at my best self. You said you haven't necessarily seen that much drop off in the way in your practice uh, moving it from generally face to face to uh, virtual. But do you see a change in some of the ratios? Because you speak about emotional, intellectual, physical, conversational intelligence. Mm -hmm. Do you think this, at this period, during this pandemic, we need some a little more? Uh, not even saying that we may need some less, but are there others that you think we need to work on to get a little better or more, a little more conversant with them? At this point in time, at times of uncertainty, the critical skills we need are the ability to have developed inner, inner peace within ourselves and out of that inner peace, being able to listen better, be more compassionate, be more flexible, be comfortable with uncertainty and appreciating at leaders that we don't know it all because nobody knows it all. And therefore we need to be more collaborative in our organizations. That the wisdom in the organization may not necessarily be housed in one person. It may not only be housed in the executive team. That we need to be able to engage our organizations in a way, this conversational intelligence where people are comfortable expressing themselves, adding value to the discussions, and coming to collaborative and co-creative discussions. So it's, it's critical that people become what I call fully intelligent. And when I talk about fully intelligent, I talk about physical intelligence, being aware as to what your body is saying, whether it's saying it's time to rest, or whether it's saying I should not trust what is this um, decision that we are about to make? Physical intelligence, the emotional intelligence to know how you manage yourself because we all experiencing trauma, executives and staff, and therefore being able to discern whether the behavior I'm say, seeing is associated with the trauma that this person is experiencing but not necessarily expressing. So creating an environment where people feel comfortable to express their vulnerability. And then how do we reframe, as you had asked me earlier on in terms of the timeout, how do we reframe the changes that need to be implemented critically in a way that people don't see them as a threat, that they see that there's a positive in it. And then of course, well, the spiritual intelligence, which really takes us into our ability to move beyond ego and operate from our higher self. And in terms of moving and moving and looking at things from a positive point, the positive thing is that we have so much more to talk about. Slightly negative was that we're out of time at this point in time. But we want to thank you so much, Judy Joseph McSween, for lending your time and insight to this discussion. And we want to thank you on behalf of the entire news team for tuning in.